Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel uh, and welcome back to another weekly reading vlog. Today it is Friday. It is a really yucky day outside. It's cold and rainy. We've had some really crazy weather here the past couple of weeks. It was icy around last week this time, a lot of freezing rain. We were really concerned, you know, that the power was going to go out. And so I missed uploading last week because I was concerned about editing and everything on my phone and then potentially the power going out and not having access to my phone. And then a couple of days ago, it was sunny and 70 degrees. Uh, and so now we're back to being cold and rainy. And I prefer the cold and the rain. I know it's an unpopular opinion, uh, but I'm at my happiest when it's cold and rainy. I'm at my happiest on an overcast day, in truth. It doesn't really have to be raining. There just has to be some cloud cover uh, and I will be at my happiest. But I'm so glad that I got some footage of the ice and the snow that came through because unfortunately, I think that's all that we're gonna get this year. It is Friday, it is the end of February. Uh, and so I thought I would tell you what I am planning on reading this weekend and what I've been reading. So I've been able to finish a couple of books this week, which was really awesome. Uh, so I can start a new audiobook and I can also start a new physical book. I have actually become one of those people who read multiple books at once. And I don't know how this happened to me. And I don't necessarily know that I like it because I do think it's actually to the detriment of all of the books that I am reading more than one at one time because I'm often more interested in one than another. But I really like having an audiobook on the go. And so I think my audiobook, the next audiobook I will pick up, will be the second in the Nero duology by Margaret George. I'm not sure what the title of that one will be, uh, but I really, really loved The Confessions of Young Nero when I read it last month. And so I am really excited to continue on in that series. I'm thinking about doing a video all about Nero because that book has really had me thinking about him and has really had me analyzing why we think the way that we do about Nero. Uh, and so I think it will be an interesting read to finish up this duology. Uh, so I'm planning to start that as an audiobook, but I don't know that I will start that this weekend. But uh, I am currently in the middle of another book that I don't plan on finishing this weekend or even this month. Uh, and that is The History of the Church by Eusebius. I have been reading this a little bit at a time here and there. And it's been really interesting and I have been annotating it, as you can see, based Basically, all of the pages have a little bit of a note on them. This has been a really fascinating work of the ancient world to me, and I don't think it's going to be one that I would readily recommend to people because I think you have to be very interested in early church history specifically to want to read anything about this. And so I don't know if there's much value in it if you're not into that history side of things or if you're not somebody who is really into the history of Christianity, of early Christianity in particular. But this is a really interesting book. And it's also really interesting how he's written it because his personal opinions don't really show up on the page too often. He's too busy quoting from other works and basically just giving you segments from other historians talking about these events, which is an interesting way to view kind of historiography of the ancient world. I think he was the first to kind of do this, Eusebius. And so it's kind of a modern history, but written in the ancient world. It's really interesting. And it was more of a historiography than a straightforward history book, which I think would also make it a difficult sell for people uh, because it is very much here's what so-and-so had to say about this. Here's what another scholar had to say about this. Uh, and so I think that has the potential to become rather tedious, but uh, I am enjoying this and I really like the way that he's writing and I love all of the references that he's making. This is just a really, really interesting book. I am not out of the apostolic age, so the age during which all of the apostles were living. Uh, and so once they all die or are martyred, uh, we will move into another area of the early church. And he has an entire chapter on all of the martyrs of Gaul. Uh, and so I had heard that before, that there were a lot of martyrdoms um, in kind of Southern France in that area during the years of early Christianity. And a lot of them were killed in arenas, if I'm not mistaken, you know, impaled by bulls, ripped apart by lions, like absolutely horrible stuff. Uh, and so I'm interested to get to that chapter because I do find the martyrs to be extremely fascinating and I find their faith, you know, incredibly admirable. He often kind of 
interjects that he doesn't know whether or not certain things happen, but you're supposed to take them on faith. And so I'm kind of interested to see if he will say that he believes any of the martyrs' tales uh, were fake or were kind of embellished. Uh, so I'll be interested to see what his opinion is on that. But this has been a really fascinating work of the ancient world. This week also marked the bicentennial of uh, Keats's death in 1821. He died on February 23rd, 1821. Uh, and so this was the bicentennial of his death this week. So I decided to pick up some Keats and start reading him. And what I have recently been reading have been the Odes, which are some of Keats's most famous poems. My favorite so far, and I don't know if this is a popular opinion, but it is the Ode on Melancholy. It's absolutely beautiful. It's just so beautiful. It's so short too. I really liked Ode on a Grecian Urn, but something about Ode on Melancholy just hit me like a ton of bricks. And it was very much like this kind of philosophical poem talking about sadness and how you can give in to sadness and you can kind of let melancholy or depression um, rule you, but you shouldn't. Because often when you're feeling melancholy, when you're feeling depressed, you don't want to experience joy because you know it will go away. Uh, in some way, you're fearful of being happy because you know that can be stolen from you. And the poem kind of wants you to experience joy and experience happiness because that's the point of life, even though it is fleeting. And perhaps because it is fleeting, that is why you should try to experience as much joy as you can in your life. It's a really deep poem and uh, I really, really enjoyed it. But I also enjoyed Ode on a Grecian Urn, as you might can imagine because it was all about history. Uh, so I scribbled all over it. I also scribbled all over the Ode to Melancholy. The Ode on a Grecian Urn was just really, really beautiful. And it really kind of meditated on what about us will live on and how there are good things and bad things about immortality. So like he's looking at a Grecian Urn and he's kind of postulating what the figures on this urn would have been doing, what their lives were like, who potentially might have owned this urn, um, and things like that, which is really fascinating. And he doesn't know the full story. He's just making assumptions about what these people could have been like. And so he kind of says, of course, these things have lived on, which is really amazing. So they are immortal. They don't experience age. They don't experience death. But on the flip side, while you are immortal and while you can experience death and you don't really experience age, you do have to experience forgetfulness, you know, memory loss. People will forget about you and they will also forget about the details of your life. A really, really beautiful, beautiful poem. And so I'm looking forward to reading more from Keats. I think I might read some more of his letters. I will let you know. Uh, I just think he's a really fascinating person. So up next for me is the Pickwick Papers by Charles Dickens, because this is the pick for the Dickens or Tolstoy read along that's happening over at Emma from Emmy and Carolyn from Carolyn Marie Reads' channels. Uh, the read along is over February and March for the Pickwick Papers. Uh, and so I am really excited about this. And I know in my heart, I'm going to prefer this to Tolstoy, given that I DNF to the first pick for this kind of book club that was a Tolstoy book. I do feel prompt for the Pickwick Papers, but I have heard this is really not Dickens's best, and of course it's not. It's his first published work, but I've heard that what about this is really poorly done is the female characters, and I've heard that before. I've heard it about a lot of Charles Dickens's earlier titles is that he really had to work hard to kind of master female characters, uh, and some people don't think he ever mastered them. Some people don't think he could write female characters at all. I would say I've been really impressed with Esther from Bleak House so far, and I also thought the women of Great Expectations were really great. Uh, I did not think the women of A Tale of Two Cities were great at all. Uh, so I am a little bit apprehensive about this, and I'm also apprehensive because I've also heard that this is set up in a similar way to a little bit like a short story collection or something like that where they're telling little vignettes that are vaguely related, but that ultimately don't have much bearing on the overall plot, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know very much about the Pickwick Papers at all, and I've tried to keep it that way. Uh, and so I think there are going to be drawbacks to this for me personally in terms of structure and potentially in terms of how the female characters have been written. But I also think I'm going to enjoy it because I do typically like the way that Dickens writes. 
So I picked up a physical copy of this so that I could try to use their annotation system. Emma and Carolyn have put up their annotation systems on their Instagram highlights. And so I will link to their Instagrams down below if you're interested in that and to their Dickens or Tolstoy announcement videos because I think this is a really fun read along, um, but it will be a very long time until we're finished. Uh, so I think it's going to be fun and I'm excited to see what everybody's feelings are for the first Dickens but I thought I would try to annotate along with them so that I could really um, get into things when they host their live show. I'm looking forward to starting this this weekend. It might not be today, but uh, I am looking forward to picking this up. It is so huge. I don't know how long it will take me to get through this, but uh, I am looking forward to it. Last but not least, this is the really exciting thing. Uh, my coworker who I've been reading Bleak House with, uh, we've been reading a bit of Bleak House every month and then meeting and having lunch and talking about it every month. Uh, he mistakenly ordered two sets of a trilogy and he gave me one of them very kindly. He was so kind about it and he kindly gave me uh, a new set of the Grisha Trilogy, and they're so beautiful. I haven't seen these new covers. They're just so beautiful. Look at Shadow and Bone. Incredible. Uh, and so the Netflix series just got a trailer today, and I have been planning to reread the Grisha Trilogy for a very long time, and I kind of want to reread everything in the Grishaverse because the last book in the Nikolai duology comes out at the end of March. So I kind of thought it would be fun to kind of reread the Grisha trilogy, Six of Crows, and then that Nikolai book before that came out because I do believe the last book in the Nikolai duology will probably be the last book that we get in the Grishaverse for a while anyway. That's my interpretation of events. So I kind of want to get ready for the show, but I also uh, want to get ready for the last book in the Nikolai duology. And so I am so excited. I'm definitely starting this today. I'm going to start this immediately after I finish filming here. But I did kind of pester Svea from Svea Shaika. I'll link to her channel down below into reading this with me. She's already started Shadow and Bone. She's on chapter eight, I believe. Uh, and so I am going to try to catch up to her tonight. So hopefully we will be reading the series together. And I think it's gonna be fun to reread it and have somebody to talk to about it, especially because I know there are a lot of moments in this trilogy that I probably don't remember, that I remember vaguely, but I don't remember the specific about, but I am really excited about rereading this trilogy. This is my favorite YA series of all time. And I know most people prefer Six of Crows. Sorry. I'm really attached to Alina as a character, I think, and I'm also really weirdly attached to Mal. And so I just have always felt more of a connection to this trilogy, though I do agree Six of Crows is much better written, and I think the characterization uh, is better done, but I am really interested to reread these and then kind of compare them to the show because I know the show is kind of smushing Six of Crows and the Grisha trilogy together. I'm not sure how well that's gonna work, but I think I'll probably enjoy it anyway. The trailer looks absolutely incredible. So that's what I'm currently reading and those are my reading plans for the weekend. Uh, I might get up in the morning and take a bag to my used bookstore because I already have another bag filled up and so I have a few things on my list that I would like to look for at the used bookstore uh, and so hopefully I can find some things. I will go on and start reading and I will talk to you later. A lot of you guys have asked how I annotate, and so often with poetry, this is something that I'll do. Uh, so this is Ode on a Grecian Urn by John Keats, and so I start off by writing the date that it was published or written. So this was published, written in 1819. The meter that it's in, this is written in iambic pentameter. And then sometimes I'll also put the date that I read it. Uh, so I read this on February 24th. Uh, and so often the main thing that I do, this is typically all I do, is I underline, you know, lines that I think are particularly beautiful or that are references to other things. I have started really liking circling. Uh, so this is a reference to the Elgin marbles. And so I often like to kind of circle now because I do think it's really eye-catching and it lets me know where my particular notes are. So this is kind of the thing that I am into right now. I have gotten recently some erasable pens. And let me tell you what, they are life-changing. Absolutely life-changing. It's really uh, allowed me to be very confident in making notes and scribbling all over things because I know 
that I can erase any mistake that I make. So this is Ode on Melancholy. I did kind of a similar thing, but see, I didn't see anything worth underlining here apparently, though a lot of it was really beautiful, so I'm not sure why I didn't underline anything, but that's kind of my typical way. I also often stick in a little um, sticky note with some kind of note on it if I don't want to write on the page. This was prior to my erasable pens, unfortunately. And so I was kind of using a mix of pen and pencil. Uh, so here we go, this is some pencil. I wrote a lot about kind of what these poems are, why he wrote them, kind of his complex feelings. Like right here, this is about Lord Byron. He had really complex feelings on Lord Byron. And so I wrote that there is a letter that is also talking about how he feels about Lord Byron uh, towards the back of this collection. So this is typically what I do with poetry. With books, it's much simpler. I typically only underline or only tab uh, in books because there's often not the space to write any kind of notes in the margin. That's not always true, as you can see here in uh, the history of the church. I have written all over these pages, also in an erasable pen. Uh, and so I have really enjoyed using an erasable pen because it really feels very freeing. Uh, and so this is kind of typically what I have been doing lately in terms of annotation. So it is Sunday now. Uh, yesterday, I did wind up going to the used bookstore and I completely forgot to take any sort of footage in there. But uh, I really got a lot of things. In fact, I think so much that I should probably do an actual book haul. But I did get some really, really stellar editions of Shakespeare. These were the highlight of my trip to the used bookstore yesterday because they are the Oxford Shakespeare's and a lot of people swear by these and for a lot of people these are the only editions of Shakespeare that they want to have anything to do with because apparently the introductions to these are really stellar which is interesting because I often don't find Oxford to have as good of an introduction as Penguin does. I think their introductions are typically very short and they don't give you a whole lot to work with really but uh, apparently these, the introduction is as long as the play. It certainly is in the case of Othello. Uh, I will show you where the introduction is. You'll be shocked. Here you go. That's the introduction. Can you believe that? But uh, I picked up Othello, which has historically been my least favorite Shakespeare play, but I do think I'm due for a reread of it, and I think if I have some really great notes with it, that I will probably come to at least respect it if not love it. Uh, so I don't expect to ever fully love Othello. There's a lot of miscommunication in Othello that is really, really irritating to read for the modern reader, I think. Uh, but I do think it's also probably one that fares much better on stage. I have never seen it performed, but I'm sure that that really adds to the atmosphere of Othello and the tragic nature of it. But uh, I definitely need to do a reread of Othello, but I am really excited because I think this is going to be a massive introduction and hopefully it will have a lot of great information. I also picked up The Tempest, which I have not yet read. In fact, I think the rest of these I haven't read and I am shocked I've never read The Tempest because I have an incredibly good feeling about it. Uh, and this is the one that's kind of set on an island and has a magician as a character, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know very much about The Tempest and I wanna keep it that way. But this one looks to have an actually very short introduction. There's the introduction. Pretty, pretty good. These introductions are apparently at least 100 pages, which I think is really interesting and can also be very valuable for a student who is just getting into Shakespeare. Uh, and so I think I'm really going to enjoy these editions, but I did pick up The Tempest. I also picked up The Two Gentlemen of Verona, which I have been looking forward to for years. I have a really, really good feeling about Two Gentlemen of Verona. I typically love his Italian set plays. I think mostly because they are set in Italy. I am very predictable, but I think I'm going to really enjoy this one. Uh, this is one that I think has been fairly controversial in the past couple of years. Maybe not, maybe that's The Merchant of Venice, which I also picked up. Uh, but one of these has been fairly controversial for its portrayal of Jewish characters, I believe. So perhaps that's The Merchant of Venice now that I'm thinking about it, but I'm really looking forward to both of these. These are both Italian set plays. I think I'm really going to enjoy them. And then last but not least, I got Henry IV Part Two, and I just couldn't resist this because I love this. Just love this portrait. This is actually a portrait of Henry V, interestingly enough. Uh, so I think I have read Henry IV before, but it has been an incredibly long time. And it seems like I thought Henry IV was really doing a lot to set up Henry V, and apparently that's the case because why use a portrait of Henry V? 
on the cover of this book. But uh, I am really interested to read this again, and I think part two can really stand on its own if I'm remembering correctly. But I do love the history plays. They are my favorites. But to me, these were easily, easily the highlight of the trip to the used bookstore. I'm really excited. Um, I also got a few things that I'm really, really excited about and hoping to get to soon. We'll see if that really happens. Let's talk about some reading updates. I did catch up to Svea and Shadow and Bone. Uh, we are on chapter eight. I don't think we're going to check in with each other again until Friday. I think we're just going to see where we each get to uh, because I could easily sit down and finish this today. But we both really want to take this kind of slowly, but I am already just really, really loving this. You know, you often think, I believe anyways, with the first book in a series that you kind of look back on it retrospectively as something special because you know where the series is going to go. But when I first read Shadow and Bone, I really, really loved this first book and it was instantaneous. Like I actually remember when I picked it up, where I was sitting and that I couldn't put it down. And I think the first half of Shadow and Bone is actually really riveting. That's something that I didn't really recall about about it is how fast things happen, how rapidly events start to occur. And so I'm really kind of shocked that that's a pacing thing that I enjoyed a few years ago because I often used to really like a slower paced book. In fact, I still do. I like things to have a little bit of breathing room. And so I was reading my initial review for this that I wrote immediately upon finishing it when I read it for the first time. And I even said, I don't think this deserves five stars on merit, but in terms of enjoyment, it absolutely does because I talked about the fact that there were more than a few things that I thought should have been given breathing room that should have been a little bit more detailed. And I absolutely kind of agree with that. I have to say I agree with that because I think as this goes on, I am definitely going to want more detail from it. And I think that's something that Lee Bardugo in general has kind of improved upon is that now I would say like King of Scars when that came out a couple of years ago, I thought that was extremely slow. And in fact, I also thought Crooked Kingdom was a little bit slow, the second in the Six of Crows duology. And so this is a very fast paced series with a lot happening and it's also very stereotypically YA, which I think is perhaps why it's my favorite series of hers, because I do really love A Chosen One story. Um, I love A Love Triangle, and I do love kind of the fast-paced, world-changing events that typically happen in kind of a stereotypical YA series. Six of Crows is on a much smaller scale, and actually, weirdly enough, you would think King of Scars would be on the scale of Shadow and Bone, but it also feels very small and insular in terms of character development. So I do think Shadow and Bone and the Grisha trilogy in general really was focused more on the plot than they were on the characters. I think her other books are focused more on the characters than on the plot to the point where I definitely see criticisms of her other books because a lot of people will say they don't really have a plot. It's just kind of a vehicle for the characters. But I think this series really strikes a perfect balance because she doesn't sacrifice character for plot. Plot is just something Something that's really driving the story along. But I already feel maybe 120 pages in. Yeah, that's where I am. I'm 120 pages in. I already feel as though the characters are really identifiable, that they all have a very individual personality. I am just really, really enjoying the experience of rereading this. This has just been already such a fantastic experience. I did start the Pickwick Papers. I'm only 30 pages in. I am enjoying this so far. I think it's very choppily written to a point where it's a little bit confusing for me right now because I don't even really understand who the Pickwick group is, the Pickwick Club. I don't really understand their purpose as of yet, but we do have like 790 pages to get through. Uh, so I'm sure I will learn, but I already find this very funny. And the interesting thing is the introduction talked about the fact that as Charles Dickens' career goes on, that his books become more serious. The humor is just kind of a little bit here and there to kind of make a situation seem a little bit less serious. Whereas in the Pickwick Papers, you don't have to worry about the fact that if somebody is drunk and falling over, that he's making a comment on the fact that alcoholism is really terrible. It's always played for a joke. In the Pickwick Papers, it's not talking about the really serious issue of alcoholism in London in the 19th century, which I think is really interesting. But apparently there will be a shift 
towards the very end to a more serious tone uh, because somebody I think is going to go to debtor's prison. And so he wrote this over a couple of years. And so apparently he was already kind of transitioning his style of writing. He was already interested in a different tone to the Pickwick Papers. And so the end of the Pickwick Papers feels very different to the beginning, which I think will be really interesting. And I kind of wonder if I will prefer the ending of the book to the beginning, because I think I kind of struggle with comic writing in general. So I am really excited about this, but I'm also a little bit apprehensive about it because I think people often think this book is too long. I definitely see that that will be the case. I question when a book is over 500 pages whether it needs to be that long. And I often question too when a book is under 500 pages whether it needs to be that short. 500 seems to be a pretty good sweet spot for me. Uh, so those are the two books that I am currently reading. I didn't wind up reading any more of Keats this weekend which is unfortunate. I also have not made very much progress or progress worth commenting on in the history of the church by Eusebius. That's an interesting book, but I don't really know that it's one you should read straight through. It's not one I can read straight through because it seems really bogged down in information. It's really trying to convey a lot to you and it kind of conveys it in a way that some people might call dry. So I'm not really sure whether or not it's a book I would recommend to a whole bunch of people. Uh, I'm still in the middle of those and I intend to be in the middle of Keats and the history of the church for months. Uh, so those updates will be sporadic. They will be few and far between. So I will definitely check in with you later, but that's all I have for now. It is Tuesday. Sorry that I didn't update you yesterday, uh, but I do have some reading updates to talk about right now. Uh, so I am a good ways into the Pickwick Papers. A good ways, I say, but I am actually on page 66. Uh, so I really have not made it a good ways, but I am thoroughly enjoying this. I decided to use the tabbing system that Emma and Carolyn will be using. So they've kind of color-coded tabs. I'll tell you really quickly what their system is. Uh, pink is love, which I'm not really quite sure what that means because the next one, yellow, is quotes. So I guess pink would be something that you put on a scene you particularly enjoyed rather than a specific line. Uh, green is imagery. Blue is sad. Uh, orange is something you disliked. Uh, they have a color that they have designated for their debate, so stuff that they will debate each other on, so that's kind of irrelevant to me. But uh, purple is funny. Uh, and so I have two yellows right now. So I have two quotes. I think that Charles Dickens has some really stellar quotes, but I do think they are kind of wedged in between other scenes. I think his really great quotes come in scenes that you don't expect, if that makes sense. They don't come in these really big, sweeping, grand scenes of emotion, typically for me. Sometimes it's just a line of description where he's talking about a particular character or an action or something like that, and it really gets me. Uh, so the first quote that I underlined was, poetry makes life what lights and music do the stage. Strip the one of its false embellishments and the other of its illusions, and what is there real and either to live or care for? Uh, and so that was actually a conversation with somebody who is a poet. Uh, but I did highlight something sad, which I didn't expect so early on in the Pickwick papers, but this is apparently going to be kind of a series of vignettes where the members of the Pickwick Club are interviewing people, and those people are telling a very specific story. It doesn't have to be about them. I've only read really one story so far, but 
that story was really sad. And it was about a man who was drunk all the time, so drunk all the time that they essentially kind of kicked him out of the theater he'd been working in. And so he was working odd jobs in other theaters, but he always kept in touch with this guy. This guy was always trying to look out for him. And eventually he's on his deathbed, you are led to believe, from his drinking. And he comes over there, his wife sent for him. He comes over there and the man starts going on and on. My wife's gonna kill me, my wife's gonna kill me because I have been so terrible to her. I've beat her, I've starved her. Uh, and so she's definitely gonna give me what's coming to me. She's gonna starve me and do everything back. And that's kind of how the story leaves off. And I thought, in what way was there anything humorous to that? Because I've been led to believe that these kind of small vignettes, these little stories within a story are gonna kind of be vehicles for his comedy. And that to me was actually really serious. Maybe he wants you to interpret it as dark comedy rather than kind of straightforward laugh out loud comedy but I thought gosh that was like intensely sad and also a really good glimpse into a different side of life in London. I'm really now intrigued by the theaters of London in the Victorian period. That was really, really interesting. But uh, there's also been a lot of really funny stuff. Of course, a man lost his hat. That's a really famous instance, apparently, in the Pickwick Papers where a man's chasing his hat through the streets. And it, it really was funny. I think Charles Dickens has a gift with being able to allow you to see everything perfectly. I think he describes things in such a way that you can really perfectly visualize them. And so I do have a green tab, which is imagery, and it was him describing a dock or something like that with all the ships coming up to it. And I said, it's just spectacular. I think Charles Dickens is great. I'm a Charles Dickens super fan. I really don't think Tolstoy will ever beat him for me. Sorry, Tolstoy, and I know I might be speaking a little bit soon as I've only read one thing fully <laughs> from Tolstoy and I DNF'd another. And I have read several things now by Charles Dickens and I have enjoyed them all. While I think there are some issues, I have just genuinely had a good time with Charles Dickens and to me that's the most important part of reading. And so I think this whole kind of read along of Dickens versus Tolstoy has taught me already a lot about who I am as a reader. And I think some people read classics for a different reason to me. And I think some people are searching for things in classics that I don't typically search for. I honestly just search to be entertained. That's the honest truth. Uh, and books that were written 200, 300, 400 years ago have the ability to entertain me uh, just as much as books that were published last year. But I think often there is kind of this conception around classics that you're learning something or that something deeper is going on. They're imparting some kind of lesson or some kind of deep philosophical knowledge of the human experience. And I think Tolstoy probably hits on that more than Dickens does. And I think Dickens does hit on it. I don't want to say Dickens is purely an entertaining writer and that's why I like him. I think he does play with all of these deeper issues, but I think he does it very subtly. And I think it's present even here in what is really going to be a completely comic novel to my knowledge. Uh, so I am just really fascinated to see how I feel about this as I continue on with it, but also how I feel about reading Dickens and reading Tolstoy and what I expect to get out of both of them. Because I don't really think they set out to do the same things, but there is something about them that's very similar. And I think that has to do with characters. I think that has to do with crafting real characters and real situations. So I'm just thoroughly enjoying this. This has a really interesting publication history as well and really fraught between Charles Dickens and the illustrator of this. Uh, and so I am thinking about maybe doing a dedicated review when I finish this because I am thoroughly enjoying it and I feel like I have a lot of things to say and I'm already taking up so much time in this update just talking about the first 60 pages, but I am thoroughly enjoying this. Yesterday I started The Splendor Before the Dark by Margaret George, which is the second in her Nero duology. And I read some more of that today. I listened to that today. And so I'm about halfway through it. This has been majorly disappointing when I compare it to the first one. The first one had me so fully gripped. And with this one, it's like I've been looking for excuses to not listen to it, which sounds as if I'm not enjoying it, but I am. I am really enjoying it. I think the thing here is, is that the first book covered maybe the first 26 years of Nero's life, give or take. 
And then this book is going up to his death. So there's only about four years. And this book is the same length. And while a lot happened, we don't really know everybody who was involved in all of these various situations uh, that Nero was involved in. And so to me, it's like I don't have any kind of emotional connection to it. Like he just found out about a conspiracy against him. All of his friends were in on it. And I thought, well, you know, it would have been wonderful to really see more of his friends. And then we could have felt really bad with him. We could have felt betrayed with him. Uh, we could have felt terrible that we were going to have to punish these people alongside Nero. And it would have been a really great moment to help us understand Nero as a character. And I think the weird thing is, though, you do understand Nero as a character, despite the fact that you don't really know anybody else in the narrative. It is, for the most part, first person from his perspective. There are two other perspectives, but they are few and far between, and they don't really contribute much, in my personal opinion. But my issue with this is not so much that it's been slower paced than the first one, but it is that in this one, to me anyway, Nero has been whitewashed to such an extent that you would believe him innocent of anything. And I will agree that Nero has probably historically been blamed for a lot of things he didn't do. He definitely didn't fiddle while Rome burned. But in this book, this book basically opens with the great fire of Rome. And he of course was not fiddling when Rome burned. He was down there, he was down there with the firefighters. He was trying to put out the fires. Uh, and so while he was down there trying to put out the fires, he heard somebody as they like threw a torch onto a house, they were deliberately setting fire. Uh, they said, thank you, Jesus. Uh, I am ready to bring on the end times. I'm ready for your coming. I'm ready for the second coming. That was a very poorly <laughs> paraphrased version of events of what he heard. But so he actually essentially really did hear a Christian confirm that they wanted to burn the city of Rome down to bring about the end times. Uh, and so he actually has an out. He very much has a scapegoat because he can say, yep, yep, I actually heard a Christian while the fire was going on and I witnessed them set fire to somebody else's house. Uh, and so he brings in all these Christians and he says, tell me, you know, what's fire to you? Why is this so important to you? And this is actually very interesting to me because they quoted a lot of really well-known scripture. And a lot of the scripture, a lot of the uh, letters of Paul in particular, and a lot of probably the writings of Peter uh, really are incendiary and very anti-Rome to the Romans, you can imagine, very anti-Rome to them. Uh, and so I've never really thought about it in that context. Like if I was a Roman, if I was a Roman emperor and I heard some of the scripture kind of taken out of context, what would I think these people were doing? Uh, and so I give him the benefit of the doubt there. But in so many ways, I had to question how they interpreted Peter and Paul's words in particular. They quoted specifically um, words that Peter spoke and that Paul wrote to them. Uh, and there was imagery of fire and kind of like a hellfire sense in a sense that, you know, the world is kind of falling into sin. And so I just wondered why they automatically took it literally, especially when Nero was a poet, but this was just one instance. He clearly had an out because he witnessed somebody say it. Uh, and so the rumors about him potentially starting the fire, uh, that's always a rumor. He's like, I can't believe anybody would say that about me. You know, I was down there fighting the fire. And you know, perhaps historically he was. I am not gonna really argue with the fire part of things because I don't think he fiddled while Rome burned, but I also don't really think he did much of anything. Uh, and so that's really where I start to question things. I said, this is a really big moment and it's a great opportunity to kind of rehabilitate his image. But in so many cases, the great fire being only one, Nero comes off looking squeaky clean. There's a conspiracy against him. All his friends are conspiring against him. And you legitimately have to wonder why. Why on earth are they conspiring against him? What has he done genuinely? What has he done that is so terrible that you would want to kill him? And so I think there's quite a bit of misdeed on his part that Margaret George left on the cutting room floor or that she just frankly never wrote about because she has an agenda with this book. I just think this is a really interesting duology and I have to say I really like Nero. I never expected those words to come out of my mouth, but uh, I do really, really 
like Nero. Uh, and so I would like to read immediately a biography and kind of compare this side by side because I just can't believe it. I don't believe he's innocent of everything. I also don't believe the kind of terrible um, portrayal of him that's often shown in the ancient histories. I think Tacitus is maybe the only ancient historian that kind of gives a fairly favorable picture of Nero, and favorable is a stretch, but he doesn't outright blame Nero for the fire of Rome, and so for Nero that's positive. But Suetonius, Cassius Dio, all of them slander Nero for a wide variety of things, uh, and so I think some of those things we forgive in the modern age because he wanted to be a poet, he wanted to be a musician, he wanted to be a chariot rider. We don't see anything wrong with that. That was kind of a class discussion in the Roman Empire. But there were other things that Nero did that weren't so fabulous, and he definitely was not always innocent. So I don't think I will finish this one this week. I'll probably finish it next week, but I am definitely, definitely gonna find me a big chunky biography of Nero, because I mean, I want some detailed information. I want a blow by blow of his entire life. Because of this series, I have decided to do a Nero video. Uh, so hopefully that will come very soon when I have all my ducks in a row and I've done all my research uh, because I find Nero a very fascinating figure. And this is the thing about all controversial figures. I feel this way about Richard III, uh, who is my favorite historical figure. I don't necessarily want to hear the tried and true villainous route because I'm very tired of that in most cases. But I also don't think there's much value in portraying people like that as a saint, because there has to be a root to some rumors, in my opinion. Uh, there's definitely got to be a root to why people have always talked about Nero as being particularly terrible. Uh, and there definitely also has to be a root for Richard III, and there are several other figures like that in history. Uh, and so I don't think Either extreme is the way to go. I just really want nuance. I want nuance in historical fiction, but uh, this is a great historical fiction series and fiction is definitely what it is. But uh, I do highly recommend this series. I am loving Margaret George and I have a couple more of her books that I think I will definitely be reading soon. So it is now Thursday and I think I will wrap up the vlog here. I don't really have much to update in terms of reading. I am still reading the Pickwick Papers. I am still carrying on with Shadow and Bone. Tomorrow I get to talk to Spea about our next part, so I'm really excited about that. And I think next week will be more of the same, so I likely won't do a weekly reading vlog next week because I think you've already heard me say quite a bit about these books. But that is going to be all from me today. I hope that you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.